old trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley with you. And today we've got the story of, well, there are all sorts of bigger-than-life people in the, in the West, but this guy, he, he put a completely different benchmark around a contributor, a talented, respectable, honorable man. This was him. Yeah, I, I call him the hero of Nelson, Mike. There's no doubt about it. J.O. Patnod, Joseph Oliva Patnod, was an individual who lived in Nelson for over half a century. He was a remarkable man. Nobody had any criticism for J.O. Patnod. He went through a variegated life, very fascinating individual, and uh, I got a lot, of the, a lot of the story from individuals in Nelson who remember him. He died in 1955, so he died over 40 years ago, and people remember him absolutely with absolute clarity it's amazing and uh certainly george george coletti who knew him well as an old friend of mine gave me some information ron wellwood who's a scholar in the area gave me some information ed mannings and a very very fine paper by um a scholastic paper by jeremy mowitz so all of these individuals contributed to this story on an individual who uh makes the queen city look good uh, excellent you i mean you oh, call him he could be a saint i mean he's yeah. that straight a shooter we're going to talk about J.O.P. Joseph Papanode in just a moment. Don't go away. Come on down. With Bill Barley talking about Joseph Oliva Patno. Uh, he was born in Quebec, Deberville, Quebec. He was born in Deberville, Quebec in 1871 and heard of the Yukon Gold Rush in 1896. Decided in 1897, after he had prepared himself, he became an uh, optician and he studied in Montreal and he studied in Chicago. And eventually, this guy was so skilled, he made trifocal glasses, Mike. That's how good he was. And this is in the 1890s, one of the first in Canada to make trifocals. So he's on his way to the Yukon taking a railway or a car across the states and decides to take a little side trip to Nelson, B.C. Arrives in Nelson in a, in a stagecoach, looks down on the town, looks down on the west arm of Kootenai Lake, and he sees a fledgling mining camp, and, but what he sees, he likes. And he says to himself, I won't go any farther. This is where I will stay. And this is where he stays. Okay. He then wires back to get his jeweler's bench. He's also a jeweler. He's a watchmaker. He's a jewelry manufacturer. He's a many talented individual, Mike. He mm -hmm. really is very, very interesting. Now, Nelson at this time, you love Nelson anyway. You I call do. it yeah. the uh, Queen City? It's the Queen City of the Kootenays. There's no doubt about it. It's had that title since, since about the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And Nelson, you know, in, in 1894 and 93, the... Uh, uh, the Silver King mine was booming along, and there was, there was a smelter soon after that. And the smelter, of course, is the Hall Mine smelter, which is a huge smelter. But Nelson grows dramatically yeah. from a few this hundred people. This is Baker people. Street. Look at it. It's just sure. bustling. Oh, of course. Baker Street is bustling. We have all sorts of individuals that come to Nelson. It's a point of call. We have circuses coming to town. And here's an example of a circus coming to town, showing their wares to the various people in Nelson. The Nelson Electric Tramway Company. This was an advanced place. Sure it was. Streetcars right in Nelson uh, by the late 1890s. Nelson is, uh, is a very attractive town, even at that stage. It's never lost it, by the way. Parades right? downtown. Sure. And into this environment comes Mr. Patnode. That's right, indeed. With some skills. Look at that. Now, you've got a set of... It's always amazing to take a look at the, uh, at the artifacts. This would be the kind of work that he would do. This is not yeah. one of his, no, it but isn't. it's from the era, yeah. and it's delicate. You can see that the ground lenses have to be there. So that would be the work he did, and he also did jewelry, as you pointed out. Superb he loved jewelry. he loved silver, yeah. and this one here is one of those silver engraved, and that actually is the smelter that he is actually uh, commemorated on this spoon. And the prospector at the top, and the smelter on the bottom, and it's uh, it's composed of silver. And on the back of that spoon, Mike, it's very interesting because he has. Uh, uh, patented actually or registered uh, 1906 and then he has sterling on it and he has his name patented. Those spoons are very, very difficult to find now. 
and that one is one of his. Yeah. You had one that was gold washed. You gave that one away. Well, George Coletti has done so much for me. I said, okay, here's something I owe you. And so he got the gold washed one. I kept the silver washed one. Now, okay. this, it's hard to identify when a person falls in love with the place, yeah. but he truly fell in love with the place. Oh, yeah. And this is a shot sort of from where he built his cabin, looking across the West Arm. He, did, he didn't build his cabin, Mike. Actually, at the first one, he, an interesting story here. He didn't have a cabin there. He had a tent looking across. So he could look across at Nelson and watch it grow and also get the sunny side. That's perfect, on the West that's Arm. That's perfect, yeah. That's on the West Arm. He is over there in his tent one day, and he's, he's looking over at Nelson. And down on the West Arm, of course, that's the beginning, really the beginning of, uh, of the Kootenai River. And he's, he's looking, or part of the Kootenai River, and he's looking at, and down the channel comes a, a three-roomed house. It's in great shape. <laughs> can't believe it. And he looks, in the, and there's a little current, and it draws it right in, and the three-roomed house comes right in and lands on his floor shelf. Well, Patman look, goes down and looks at it. Beautifully constructed, well-made. Can't believe it. Three rooms. He was living in a tent. He advertises, nobody's lost a three-roomed house. He <laughs> waits for a year. Nobody replies. Everybody knows that Patman is asking who's, who's lost a three-roomed house. Nobody's lost a three-roomed house. Finally, after over a year, he picks it up, lays a foundation, and lives in the house. <laughs> oh, what an amazing story. Oh, yeah, he's an amazing Just, guy. Uh, what, was, it, was it on uh, a, a barge or anything, or did it... Was floating, it down, floating down the channel all by its little self. So there you have now... Providential. Pat providential. Providential. Oh, sure. Providence figured highly yeah. in Pat Node's life, didn't it? Yo, most definitely, Mike. I'll, I'll give you an example. He was a jewelry manufacturer. He had 17 people working for him for a number of years. I mean, that's so good. He was that's a insane. watchmaker. He made jewelry. As we, we, fine example there. And he used to travel to Amsterdam, and he used to travel to London to pick up the finest gems available so that people got the very best, the very best at a reasonable price. In 1912, he's over in London, staying in Brown's Hotel. There's a ship leaving Southampton. It's called the Titanic. It's the unsinkable. So, that's good, good enough for Patman. He puts his bags, all his luggage, sends it down to Southampton. They put it on board the ship. He hires a taxi, leaving London, heading for Southampton. As he gets in the taxi, clouds over, and he says, something's going to happen to that ship. His lug luggage is already on board. The ship's unsinkable, but I see it going down. He stops there, goes back to London. The ship leaves, heads for New York, hits an iceberg, and of course, Most virtually, of virtually all the people on board the Titanic were lost. Very few survivors, over three quarters of them, gone. The unsinkable is sinkable. So, so Pat Node uh, is, uh, has ESP in this regard. He senses, oh, yeah. boy, that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand <laughs> up, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Doesn't it? So he goes over, obviously, on another ship, and his life continues. Oh, yeah. We've told other stories about dreams dashed with that very same event. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, that, that Pat Nutt is, uh, has abilities a lot of people don't have. And he's, he's visionary. He's yeah. visionary beyond his skills of optometry and jewelry making. Yeah, he sure seems to be. And that's, that's not the only story. We'll tell some others as, as the story unfolds. And, but this guy has, uh, he's, he's, he's clever in other respects, too. He makes good investments. He believes in, he likes silver as a metal. He doesn't trust paper money, which yeah. is not unusual in those days. He, doesn't, he likes silver and gold. And, um, and he also believes in mining. He thinks mining is extremely important to both the East Kootenays and the West Kootenays, and especially to Nelson. They're having trouble at this time, Mike, with silver mining. The original silver mines in the Slocan and around Moyer Lake, the St. Eugene and the Sullivan, uh, not the Sullivan so much in Kimberley, but they, the, a lot of them had very, very high silver values at the surface, and as you get down, you get more lead, lead and you get more zinc. And they were, there was a penalty on zinc because it was difficult to separate the zinc from the lead and the silver. And all the mining men, all through British Columbia, in fact, all through the West, were looking for a way of, of resolving this problem. And the CMNS had bought a huge mine. Consolidated mining and yeah. smelting, just so... Consolidated Mining and Smelting, now known as Cominco, and uh, they had bought a huge mine, and this, of course, was the, was the famous Sullivan in Kimberley in about 1909 or 1910. And, uh, but they're stuck with a zinc problem. They're looking for it, and as it happened, a number of outfits had tried to resolve this problem. They built a little, a little plant and, uh, just outside of Frank, Alberta, and they tried, other people tried it. But one day, into the jewelry store comes a guy called Andrew Gordon French, 
And Andrew Gordon French is a Scotsman, very interesting, has a background in metallurgy. And he ha learned his, uh, his trade in Swansea, Wales. And Swansea at that time was experimenting with the zinc process. And he felt that he had a, a method of electrolysis, which he felt would, the electrolytic process could resolve the problem that was facing zinc. So he starts to work on it and gets the backing of Pat Nudd and a whole bunch of Nelson business people. Now, next door, virtually next door, about 30 miles away, is the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company with a plant sitting up there. They've got the St. Eugene Mine in Moye, which is running out of ore. They've got the, the mass of Sullivan. They've got some mines in Rossman. They're looking, too. They hear that French actually has resolved this, this problem. So they come and see French. Now, this is very interesting, Mike. And I'll read from Jeremy Mowat's paper. And Jeremy Mowat is an extremely careful scholar. People will have to listen to see what he says. He says, in November of 1911, the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company's general manager, R.H. Stewart, who had worked in Anaconda before this, visited Nelson to meet with French. The two men discussed the applicability of French's process to the Sullivan ore. And Stewart returned in the early spring of the following year with two other Cominco staff members. I think one of those was Selwyn Blaylock, okay? One of them stayed in Nelson, probably Blaylock, for three months to study the process at first hand. So he stays there three months. Apparently, he filed a favorable report. For late in May of 1912, Cominco, Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company, and French signed a contract giving the company exclusive rights to French's process. Once the process was fully operational, Kaminka would pay French $200,000 and a royalty on zinc production. That is the key to it, the royalty on zinc, zinc production. In addition, Kaminka agreed to build a zinc plant with productive capa capacity of one ton a day at trail within 12 months. The company changed its plan several times, however, and the plant was not ready until May of 1914. Now, World War I is looming. French's son, Thomas, then moves to trail to get the zinc plant in operation. Kaminko, however, became increasingly dissatisfied with Thomas French's work, although they need a process now, that's my words, and in January of 1915, backed out of its contact, contract with French's complex or reduction company. So, they, they sent men there, they sent the general manager there, then they sent Blaylock there, they remained there for months, they sign a contract, then they say they're not happy with it, and they walk away from it. This is resolved by a massive lawsuit led by Patnud. Now, Patnud hasn't got a critic in the company, including the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company, because they, they question French and they question everybody else, never question Patnud. But he is fighting a one-sided battle. Here we have Patnud and French on one side and the backers of, 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 the, of the complex the process, yeah. That's right. On the other side, we have the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company, which is essentially owned by the CPR. And who backs the CPR? The Canadian, well, the, the, not the Imperial Bank of Canada, but the Bank of Montreal. So you have a huge octopus on one side and a band of little individuals on the other side. And it goes to all the way through the courts, costing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And finally, they lose the battle. Pat Node and the backers Pat lose Nod the battle. and French and everybody lose the battle. They weren't going to win anyway. And Pat Nod said, in an unguarded moment, he said, I would have taken it to the Privy Council which at that time was equivalent to the Supreme Court, which was in London. He would have taken it, but he ran out of money. You can't fight Consolidated so. Mining and Smelting, the Bank of Montreal, and Canadian Pacific Railway. That's right. And uh, the $8 million, of course, was just on the royalties. $8 they million, did, that was what they figured? $8 million. They would have, their share of the royalties would have been $8 million. This makes Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company the most gigantic mining company in British Columbia by far. And it's still in a a huge position, it is still an extremely well-known company. i got to take a breath after that, but uh, we're going to take back, uh, come back in just a moment, and when we do, keep in mind, Pat Nodes just lost hundreds of thousands of bucks, but he is still an honorable man. More on JOP after this break. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley, and we're talking about uh, Joseph Oliva Patnode, and uh, this is a commercial, little commercial announcement for J.O. He, of course, was a jeweler. Here's a man proposing to his lady, 
for the diamond lead. There it is, J.O. Patno, manufacturer of artistic rings, Nelson. He was honorable. After this court case, he owed money. His, his partners put up a lot of money they could ill afford. And Patton had felt he should pay them back most of that money, which he did. He sold his manufacturing plants, kept his jewelry store, we think, at the time, and he certainly kept his optician's business. But uh, something else happened, which is uh, unusual again. Patton is in his inner store, and he's, uh, he's feeling the pinch, of course, and a customer comes in to buy a diamond, and it's closing time. And he had a, a, a strong box, or a safe, actually, that worked on a time, on a time clock, and one of, his, one of his helpers didn't know it, closed the safe. Patton is showing all these diamonds, and the guy picks one out, pays for it, and uh, then he looks back, oh, oh, the safe's closed. So he takes a piece of uh, silver paper, puts all the diamonds on a piece of silver paper, puts it in his breast pocket. Then the customer leaves, he closes the door. Uh, Patton walks down to his boat, which is on the shore to of go across. Of course, he is still rowing across uh, the west arm of Kootenai Lake to his house, which rowed it uh, on a... He okay, loves, he rows across there. He loves it. So he rows across the lake, he ties up his boat, goes into his house, forgets all about the diamonds, comes out the next morning, unties his boat, goes across, goes across the, the west arm again, back to his shop, and says, Oh, the diamonds, the diamonds, the diamonds. What did I do with the diamonds? Just then, a Roman Catholic priest comes by, Father, Father Althoff. And Father Althoff wants to build a monstrance, which is kind of a, um, a religious artifact that is a to cross, commemorate. and it's, it's supposed to be fancy That's and right. lots of precious Christ. stones, and it'll be silver and gold and some precious stones. He knows he can get the silver and gold. He, he, can, he can get one pound of gold from the from the Kaminko Smelter and Trail, and he can get five pounds of silver, but he hasn't got the diamonds. And he walks into the store at that moment, and Patman is looking for the diamonds and can't remember where they would be. He just hasn't got a clue. And the father comes in and explains it, and he says, "Father," he says. If I find the diamonds, and I've lost a package of diamonds, I will give you the three largest for your monstrance. He then sits back and thinks about it and says, I think I heard a little splash when I was untying the boat. So he jumps back in his boat, rows across, rows across the, 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 uh, the, the west arm again, goes to his boathouse on the other side, and looks, and there he sees a little current. Around and around on the current, and there's a little sparkle. And he looks at it, it looks like silver paper. So he very carefully rows out the silver paper, and there's the silver paper still tucked together. He picks it up very gently, <laughs> opens it up, and all the diamonds are there. He then rows back with the silver paper and the diamonds intact, phones up Father Althoff, Father, Father Althoff gets his three major diamonds for the monstrance, which is still in Nelson, by the way. That is phenomenal. What yeah. a phenomenal story. Yeah. So that, the, and they wouldn't sink because this little package That's was right. like its own little boat and the diamonds would just float in there Precisely. remarkably, fortuitously, unbelievably. But you haven't heard the last of, of, of this remarkable man. Now, this, okay, I do know where you're going on this one, though. The Canadian, C Canada had no silver dollar, That's right. with one tiny exception, up until 1935. That's right. They, they made, a, made a copy in 1911 and decided not to make silver dollars because the Americans were making lots of them. But Patton had believed that they should make silver dollars. It'd be good for silver mining. And he had connections with a number of... He was a strong liberal. He had connections with a number of the prime ministers of Canada, including Laurier. And he, uh, he prevailed upon them to cast a silver dollar. So the first silver dollar came out in 1935 and followed by another number of silver dollars in 1936 and all the way down the line. Patna is so proud, and everyone knows who's in the know that Patna was behind it. He goes down to the bank, and the number varies from either he bought a hundred silver dollars or he bought a thousand silver dollars. He has a counter stamp in his jewelry shop, so he then takes his counter stamp and puts his own initials under it. He's so proud of it, not realizing, Mike that he is breaking the law. He's defacing federal oh, currency. He could, have gone, he could have gone to jail on it, but nobody even questioned it. Even the federal government winked a blind eye. They knew it was going on. It was well known all over North America that the J.O.P. On the, on, the, on the dollar, the 1935 and the 1936 was a counter stamp created by Joseph Oliver Platinum. And there it is. And That's there the it stamp is. right there. Tell me, what is the relative worth change difference between this one without Oliva's, uh, without Patno's uh, stamp, and this one with Patno's stamp? Well, I would be careful of counterpunching stamps now because somebody is probably going to make some of this. But 
If you get one of the originals, they usually sold for about twenty or thirty dollars five years That's ago, and they went to a hundred. Uh, yeah, twenty or thirty dollars. But then, if you get one with the JOP, they were selling for fifty dollars, then a hundred, then two hundred, then three hundred, then four hundred, and now they're selling somewhat over four hundred, probably in the five hundred dollar range. And they're probably all accounted for and in some all in collection. Yes, but I would I would be very careful. I would be careful of spurious. Uh, reproductions because people could take a counter stamp and make uh, yeah. uh, make something that looks like J.O.P. So he was so proud and his involvement and his encouragement was so understood nationally that they did not charge him with defacing. They credited him oh, yes. and allowed him and, to continue. And, you know, he was recognized all over. They named a hill after him and Nelson and the Pope, I believe it was Pope Pius, uh, gave him a medal, which was very, really rare in the Roman Catholic Church. He was given a medal sometime around 1947. Now, what is the story behind Patnode's will? Well, Patnod, when he died in 1955, after being in Nelson for, for 60 years, he, uh, he had an estate worth well over $100,000. But there are a number of people in Nelson who had uh, owed him money and very definitely had borrowed money from Patnod at a very reasonable rate indeed, because Patnod was that kind of man. And uh, he elected in his, last, uh, in his last year to forgive these. And some of those loans were $5,000 and so on. I've got the original copy of the original will and uh, to very prominent people in, in, in Nelson and prominent families, and he just decided to forego it. So he ended up with, a, with a, an estate of slightly over $100,000, which in 1955 was significant. Left a lot of that to the Roman Catholic Church, left a number of uh, bequests to friends and, and relatives, and uh, was really uh, uh, made his mark in the town, which, uh, which in turn respects his, his memory. Uh, he really quite a remarkable guy. I was a kid when I was in Nelson and teaching in Trail, and I could have met him. I'd heard of him, but I was pretty young then. I was in my 20s, and I didn't meet him. I regret it. I would have given him a medal, too. You considered him a man you would have enjoyed knowing. Oh, yeah. It would have been an honor to know Pat Nutt, no doubt about it. So here's this guy. I always love the whimsy of history. Here's yeah. this guy heading to the Yukon, the big noise, the big money, and somehow coming across the United States, he discovers the Kootenays. Yeah. That's where he settles and then yeah. makes indelible contributions yes. to the community yes. and fights the big fight, yes. is honorable all the way through it, and is remembered universally, positively, by everybody who ever encountered him. Oh, for sure. And this is over 40 years since his death. Well, that's a wonderful story. Yeah. Joseph Oliva Patnode, and you say this uh, paper by Mowat, does he specialize in uh, Pat, uh, Patnode, or, or is he specializing only in Kaminko? No, Mowat specializes in mining history, and very, very good writer, uh, UBC uh, graduate, and is, uh, I know him quite well. His work is superb. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much again. The story of J.O.P. And boy, I tell you, if you find one of those Canadian dollars, 1935 or 36. And sometimes later. And sometimes later, with a little tiny stamp in it, J.O.P., that is Joseph Oliva Patnode, the man we've talked about today. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Thank you.